says. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements before we get started. If anyone is in need of Spanish or Korean translation services, we have translators who are in the back. We have headsets um, that will be translating everything that our candidates are saying this morning in both Korean and Spanish. We also have um, an ASL, American Sign Language Translator, or interpreter. So um, if anyone, <clears throat> if you or someone you know needs those services, we have those available. Uh, so first, let's be reading some ground rules. Uh, in fairness to the audience, candidates, moderators, and organizers, any behavior that disrupts the smooth progression of the forum will not be tolerated. <clears throat> Security has been instructed to peaceably escort individuals out of the building if they engage in any disruptive behavior. The latter part of the forum will be a 30-minute Q&A session. You'll have the chance to ask a question at one of the circulating microphones or by writing it on a postcard to be asked by one of the moderators. If you did not receive a postcard when you walked in, there are volunteers in the aisles who can give, you, give one to you now. So if you do need a postcard, you can raise your hand. A lot of people come by and give out postcards for questions. The cards will be collected approximately 10 minutes prior to start the audience Q&A. We apologize in advance if time does not permit us to ask, to ask you a question. Please take time now to turn off, turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. Uh, and please step outside to take any calls. Finally, the organizers ask for, that you refrain from audible reactions to questions posed and answers provided, both applause and echoing. Uh, there are a lot of last topics to cover in two short hours. We will not get through it all if we have to stop every time there is a reaction. Uh, we thank you for your, your cooperation and your uh, attendance today. I want to introduce Diane Robertson, who has been instrumental in putting this all together. United Neighborhoods Neighborhood Council, who has been fantastic during the organizing of this forum. Thank you all for coming. Good morning. Um, I'm Diane Robertson. I am one, one of two co I'm with two of the co-sponsoring um, organizations of this event, um, the Empowerment Congress West Area Neighborhood Council and Sutro Avenue Block Club in Lamarck Park. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the seven neighborhood councils in District 10 who came together to collaborate on this forum. I ask that the liaisons on the planning committee stand when your neighborhood council is named. United Neighborhoods Neighborhood Council, if you're in the sanctuary, please stand and remain standing. We'll share if you can hold your applause until after I read off all of them, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council. Mid-City Neighborhood Council. Remain standing. Remain standing. Olympic Park Neighborhood Council. West Adams Neighborhood Council. Empowerment Congress West Neighborhood Council. And South Robertson Neighborhoods Council. And last but not least, if you're here from Sutro Avenue Block Club, please stand. Thank you all very much for your contribution to this forum today. I'd also like to thank Pastor Edgar J. Boyd and his amazing staff for allowing us to use their beautiful sanctuary for the forum. I know that he is not here. He'll step in when he has a break later. Uh, on behalf of all of the co-sponsors, I want to extend um, our appreciation for our candidates and their service to us, our moderators. Um, first, though, I'd like to acknowledge that the candidates partici participating today are doing so based on the objective criteria the organizers apply, specifically they are the candidates who appeared on the Los Angeles City Council, I'm sorry, the Los Angeles City Clerk's 
certified list of candidates as of December 13, 2019, which was announced in a news release on December 16, 2019. Uh, as Rahim mentioned in his remarks, we will conclude with a 30-minute audience Q&A. You will have an opportunity to ask your question, question from either the mic or write your question on a postcard to be read by one of the moderators. Uh, if you need a postcard, please raise your hand and one of our volunteers will bring it to you and will collect it from you. Final housekeeping note, we have a voter registration table set up downstairs, so if you need to register to vote, which I'm sure that's not anyone in this room, but you may need to update your voter registration information. So if you have moved or changed your name since the last time you registered or voted, you may update your information today with us downstairs. And please see Rahim after the forum. Rahim, raise hand. He can direct you to the voter registration table. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our two moderators and they will introduce the candidates. First, we have Alex Cohen, one of the anchors of Your Morning and the host of Inside the Issues on Spectrum News One SoCal. Yeah, give an applause for that. <laughs> Next, Dr. Jody Armour, a law professor who teaches constitutional law at the University of Southern California. Thank you everyone so much. It is so heartening and just really exciting to see people taking time out of their weekends to be here. Uh, I think we all want to get to it as quickly as possible, so there are some guidelines for today uh, that Jody and I are going to share right now, and I will kick it off with guideline number one. Answer the question posed, and only that question. Yes, please refrain from offering extraneous information, statistics, etc., as part of the answer. Please refrain from responding as they're giving a stump speech. Candidates will have one minute and 30 seconds to answer each question except the lightning round. Which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, timekeepers will give the candidates a 30 second warning by raising a paddle, and I think you see it there, there's one that says slow, and candidates will stop when the stop paddle is raised. Or paper, paddle paper, yes. yellow red, that's the key thing. Each candidate will be given the opportunity to be the first to answer a question. The candidate to his or her immediate left will be the first to answer the next question, and so on. And so, off we go. Uh, we're going to go with our opening statements, two minutes apiece, uh, going in alphabetical order. Channing Martinez, let's start with you. Well, first, uh, thank you to everyone who organized this uh, wonderful forum. It's uh, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, great um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so the first thing, you know, we've just come off of a great weekend celebrating Dr. King's uh, legacy. Um, and, you know, he was fighting for fighting against uh, militarism, materialism, poverty, and racism. And, you know, to be frank, I'm glad that we celebrate his legacy, but I'm worried that if he were here today, that he would not be able to be elected president today. Um, because we live in such a society that does not, they're very scared to fight for those essential things in our communities. All of the four essential things that, you know, are tearing our communities apart. So, as you know, I'm running for city council and I'm running as an organizer. And I'm trying to raise revolutionary demands in light of the establishment that really has not represented our communities effectively for the last 50 years. So I'm fighting for affirmative action for black jobs. I'm fighting for uh, cutting the police budget by 50% the LAPD budget. I am fighting for 50% of all new developments in the city of Los Angeles go towards low-income housing and fighting for women's rights 
LGBT rights, um, and you know, trying to figure out how do we have an international stance and say that we must actually stop the United States government and stand against the United States government interventionism in third world countries. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone and to the organizers of this uh, press event. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the Neighborhood Council Movement. Uh, my name is Mark Ridley Thomas. I'm a resident of the 10th Council District and have been for the last 27 years. I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Los Angeles and proud to be able to say that. Uh, I simply want to say that the Neighborhood Council Movement is fundamentally important to the civic life of Los Angeles. It was in 1992 uh, when the Empowerment Congress was given birth in the wake of the civil unrest and a range of issues that uh, challenged the quality of life of the city of Los Angeles. Some of you may recall it was right here at this church where uh, Mayor Tom Bradley and the range of us who were uh, city leaders at that time on the city council, faith leaders and others, neighborhood leaders stood in deep concern. We translated that into constructive activities so that people would have a way to demystify government, to know what neighborhood services looked like and how they could engage them and improve the quality of their lives. It is my hope, my intention to take all the neighborhood councils in the 10th district and encourage them, support them, cause them to be uh, tied to the work of the 10th Council District Office. We know how to do that, we have done it, and we will continue to do that. And so I simply want to say that I am pleased that uh, the campaign has moved forward uh, with endorsements of consequence. Uh, the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, the uh, League of California uh, voters, the Los Angeles chapter, and more. Westside Young Democrats, the Trojan College students, they are coming online to a moving campaign. We'd be honored to have you do likewise. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time off from your Saturday morning to be here. My name is Aura Vasquez and I am the first Afro-Latina running for city council in Los Angeles. And for the, in my whole life, I have been beating the odds. 25 years ago, my family and I came to this country looking for a better future and for a better life. I was, one, I was the first one in my family to go to college, working days and nights. I became a community organizer and came to California because I believe in the promise that by working together, we can create the city that we want to see and that we want to live in. And for the past 10 years, I have been an organizer fighting for the most transformative issues of Los Angeles. I was also a neighborhood council representative in the Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council where I fought for luxury development and affordable housing in our community. I was an organizer for the Sierra Club, and I'm proudly can say here that I'm endorsed by the Sunrise Movement, who's pushing for a Green New Deal nationally and locally. I was also a Los Angeles Department of Water and Power Commissioner, and I truly believe in transparency and accessibility in government, and that's why I was the first commissioner in 116 years to host office hours and have a door open door policy. But let me tell you what we're gonna do together. We're gonna get LA to 100% renewables because that's gonna build and develop more jobs locally for us. We're gonna fight together for luxury development because as a renter, I'm myself scared that one day I'm not gonna have a place to call home. So I'm ready to fight for more affordable housing. And we're gonna house our unsheltered community. Why? Because they deserve a better life and not to be criminalized. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much, neighborhood councils. 
I am so grateful that you brought this forum together. It's wonderful to see so many of our neighbors and folks I've met at the door. My name is Grace Yu, and I first moved into this district when I was three in 1974. My family immigrated from South Korea, and like all immigrants, we struggled. But we made it because it was doable back then. Rent prices were not out of this world. It didn't skyrocket. So I am someone who is committed to affordable housing so that people, the young people don't leave, that they'll come back once they've lived in a different state for another college that they're attending. I want you to know my background. I'm a K-12 LAUSD alum. I started kindergarten without speaking English. I understand struggles of people with language barriers. And I understand how wonderful our city can be. Having been an executive director of two national nonprofits, I know what it takes to run and have a smooth operating office that will return constituent calls and emails. I'm also someone who is very familiar with our city, having been a DOT commissioner for four years and vice president. And as a certified mediator, I'm all about listening and having everyone sit at the table because who sits at the table, who the decision maker is so important. I wanna be the city councilwoman so we can do things to move things forward. topics and questions now, and the first topic is going to be that of homelessness. The single biggest concern on the mind of many residents these days is the level of homelessness and the apparent cost of creating supportive housing. Seventy-five percent of the homeless in downtown LA, for example, and many areas around here are African-American, black of African-American descent. Our most maligned and marginalized citizens are our homeless population, and many of us explain their plight by their internal deficiencies, rather than a lack of job, a lack of affordable housing, a lack of real health care. We don't go to the macro level social factors, but the internal ones. So the question to you, um, candidates, is one, what actions have you taken in your life, personal and professional, to help the homeless? And two, part two, identify three specific things you would support that the city could do right now to reduce harm, uh, homelessness, houselessness, the unhoused population. They have a home, they just don't have a house. Mm -hmm. The unhoused population. Yeah. Um, I'll start, we'll start with Mark Ridley Thomas. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, simply stated, homelessness is my top priority. It is now, and it is my intent to make it my prop, uh, top priority on returning, returning to the city council should you be kind enough to afford me that opportunity. Stated simply, in the 10th council district, homelessness increased from 1,300 individuals to 1,600 individuals in a year's time. I'm the author of Measure H. Measure H provided the county in its entirety $355 million annually. No one thought it could be done. We made it happen, and as a result, we've housed literally 30,000 individuals who would otherwise not have been housed in uh, the county of Los Angeles. Uh, the city of Los Angeles is the epicenter of homelessness in this county. Therefore, you know that the city of Los Angeles benefited from that deeply. And I'm a little confused as to what that yellow and that um, and that beep and so forth. Yeah. Yellow is 30 seconds left and red is your time is up. All right. Simply stated, we built affordable housing, 3,000 units. We have 1,000 in uh, development right now. And uh, simply adding to that, there are 2,000 more um, online coming through. So my commitment is homelessness. Let me make it as plain as I can. My first priority is homelessness. My second priority is homelessness. What do you think my third priority is going to be? It's going to be homelessness. Thank you very much. All 
or eventually? One of the things that I learned when I became a Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council representative was the great need in our housing regulations and rules. In Koreatown, we saw, under the administration of our current city council member, exacerbation of housing that has pushed out neighbors and that has taken people, leading them to the streets. I believe that housing is a fundamental right. And I also believe that we have not done enough. Just a couple of weeks ago, we just had the first, the first uh, building done under Measure HHH. So the same old boys club that have been leading the city are not gonna get us out of this issue. So number one, we need to tackle our high cost of living. We need to earn more money, friends. $15 an hour is not enough. I propose an increase of a dollar every year until 2025. We need to house our unhoused members of our community first. They need to get mental health services. They need to get addiction services. They need to get better education because our brothers and sisters, African American, black and brown, need to get jobs so they can have a better life. And that's the problem. A lot of us are living paycheck to paycheck. And our city is not, not taking care of us. And I am really committed, when I become your council woman, to be a fighter for you and for those that are living on the street that deserve better. The question was, what actions have I taken in my life, personal and professional? Early on, as a teenager, I regularly volunteered at the Union Rescue Mission. And for the past six years, I've been part of the LASHA homeless count. And people at Home and United know that I'm always willing to take that second precinct because there's one left over. And neighborhood councils, LASHA, City Hall, you name it, there are so many meetings I've attended on behalf of our unhoused community. Now our current experience, next door to where I live, literally next door, there is a 64 unit construction occurring to build housing for formerly homeless seniors. You know what this developer did right? They engaged the community members. So what did our neighbors do? We said, yes, bring it. That's what happens when you engage the community. If you just go ahead and bring us in at the beginning, you'll have more folks saying yes instead of no. I want you to understand that we can do so much more when we engage the community members, and that's how I will proceed. Uh, and I just want to know, because it seems the audio for our timekeepers become a, a real distraction to everyone. We've got two very qualified folks down there who are going to use cell phone technology a little bit quieter to keep on time so we can focus on what our candidates are saying. Pardon for the interruption. Thanks for our time. First thing is, I've been an organizer for the last 15 years working for the Bus Riders Union. And as one of the prime examples, in 2010, when the Metro was going to raise the fares for the second time um, in 10 years, we actually did an actual uh, fast and slept on the streets with the homeless to really symbolize that this fare increase is going to push a lot of people into homelessness. And in 2007, when, which was my first MTA board meeting, you know, we had 800 people there. One woman come up, came up and you know, she only had a minute to speak. And she said, are you going to take the food out of my baby's mouth? Or are you going to actually take the rent money that I actually have, right? So you know, I've been on the streets fighting for everyone, including my own life. Uh, and there was a time that I, I was almost homeless and we have to move out of South Philly, right? Um, I'm fighting for the homelessness. I want 50% of all new developments in the city to go for low-income housing. I think I want the city to be able to start buying land from developers and become their friendly competition. And if developers, because we can't really force them to commit free, uh, you know, low-income housing because they want to make profit off of our lives, the city doesn't need to make that profit, right? Um, we need to, but we do have the need to actually house everyone. So. Uh, 
Our second topic is going to be development, and as we just heard in the first topic, uh, an issue that is inextricably linked with our current house systems is Jody Green crisis. Uh, the question on this front is, as much of this district has been experiencing unprecedented development, how will you ensure that development will benefit the residents of this community, both those displaced and those who remain in the area? And as we move along, we'll begin this time with our process. Thank you. We can't talk about housing, friends, without talking about the big elephant in the room, which is the money and politics. Developers are buying our local elections. You look around on the, on the um, contributions that they're making to candidates sitting here, and you see that a lot of them get over 50%, 60% of their money from developers. How can you turn around and tell them that they need to be accountable to us, the people, the residents of District 10? How are we going to do that if we don't have the right accountability in place for developers? because they're basically choosing everyone in our government. How we're going to tell the state that we oppose SB 50 because we want local control. We want to be the ones, the local communities, us should be the ones that decide what happens in our backyards. So what I propose is we need to build more housing. We need to uh, partner up with nonprofit organizations that, are, that can build affordable housing that is really affordable to us that live here, that earn $47,000 a year and that are struggling. That we need also to invest on land trusts so that we can own our homes and we can stay in our community. That we need to make sure that small businesses have the right incentives so that they can thrive and that's the District 10 I am committed to bring for us. I'm someone who actually fought against the city and brought a lawsuit when they tried to ram through a 27-story luxury building without a single affordable unit in it. There's talk about units going up, but there's no affordable units going up. Let's be real. People want affordable units, not luxury units, not what the city's been giving us. I'm someone who says we know what the needs are. And how do we do this? We use different types of materials. We use different methods. There's the tiny homes and there's prefabricated. There's the container homes. There are different options. We need to make sure that we have policies set in place that will go ahead and bring down the cost. Policy changes. The person who's in office making those policy changes will make all the difference. As a lawyer, I know how to follow the rule. And that's why I was able to bring the lawsuit against the city and win, because I knew they weren't following the law. Isn't it better to have someone in there who will follow the law or change the policy so that it works for the people? Right now, government is not working for the people, and we need to change that. about development and how you ensure that here in this district it is actually benefiting the residents of this community. Um, well, the first thing I have to say is that we as a community need to move on past just getting our fair share. And I think getting our fair share has been, at least for the last 50 years, torn our communities apart where the most affluent members of our community get their fair share. Right. Right. And many of us are left, you know, to pick up the crumbs and become homeless, mm. become homeless, right? And so I would advocate for having strict regulations on development and mainly not making profit off of our lives when we're becoming homeless, right? And so one way that you can do that is through the building and safety and permitting process, which the city says that they have their hands tied, but mainly they're just giving permits and giving building you know, uh, building codes to them and changing the code for them for their livelihood, right, uh, at the expense of our lives. So that's one way. 
And then the number two way is, as I said in the last question, that the city should have the first you know, dibs on purchasing vacant land and land that is for sale to then build their own 100% low-income housing on that land. Ladies and gentlemen, the most significant way to re-engage community participation and stakeholder interest in our communities, particularly as it relates to elevating the quality of life, is by the reinstatement of redevelopment law. When it was stripped back, we lost significant ground over the last decade. In redevelopment law, it required community participation. In redevelopment law, it required 20% set aside. In redevelopment law, it gave you a tool, a concrete tool to de deal with developers in terms of what they could and could not do if they were going to benefit from redevelopment dollars that come through the cities. And so I'm on a mission to make sure that the tools that were taken from us are restored so the empowerment that is available to neighborhood councils is real. We have to do that and that is a high priority as I return uh, to the city should you be so kind to afford me that opportunity. This is the way that the concerns around, around gentrification are addressed concretely. This is the way for us to push back and make sure that we have a very clear level of participation in the outcomes that we see. Uh, you'll note on December the 5th, I entered a motion at the Metro Board in the same week uh, on the County Board of Supervisors to address this very issue, and I'm prepared to talk to you more about that in the next round. Uh, these first several issues are really inextricably intertwined, right? There's a seamless web that's connecting them all. Affordable transportation is what we have to talk about now. Transit, right? Um, many residents, particularly those who are elderly, differently able, female who have minor children, have expressed concerns about say, personal safety, schedule reliability, and frequency of bus and rail transportation. What specific steps would you take to address safety, reliability, and frequency? And how would you pay for it? Let's start with our best way. I'm sorry. Gracie. Sure. When it comes to public transportation and safety, part of it is because there aren't enough riders. One way we can do this to increase ridership is to implement free metro passes for seniors and those with disabilities. When you bring about greater numbers, you'll have better safety. And this won't cost us anything because the metro will go whether it's empty or it's full. We might as well have it full. That's right. That's right. And the city doesn't need to spend any money on this. Isn't that great? A project that can work. Look, I also think we can incentivize businesses to have um, discounts for Metro Passes. But we need to be fair. So not just large businesses, but we should give the same opportunity to people to gather together economies of scale, right? It shouldn't just be large businesses who can get a reduction. If your community members come together block by block, wouldn't it be nice if they also could get a reduction and a benefit? We always seem to think only of corporations. What about the people? The people come together. The people matter. And that's what I think. Well, I'm proud to say that I'm the only one on this stage that has been working towards free public transportation for the last 20 years. And had a great victory where the Metro has uh, you know, passed a motion to now study free public transportation for LAUSD and all LA County students. Uh, and you know, I do want to give credit where credit is due. After 20 years, we're proud to say that Mark is actually supporting the bus riders union and signing on to this motion. Um, the, 
the other <laughs> that part was not intentional. <laughs> Um, the other thing I want to say about safety is that we mainly need to rethink what safety looks like. And mainly, a lot of the folks that we've been on the bus talking to are basically saying to get the police off the buses and to leave us alone. Yeah. And the real safety is safety from the police to the Ukraine. Um, so, once we do both of those, ridership will increase, as Grace Yu is saying, and safety concerns will disappear. We had a robust discussion on the issue of next-gen activity at the Metro this past Thursday. And it's all about how we make public transportation better. The people of this region have made that clear by virtue of the fact that they passed Measure M. Uh, Measure M is going to create huge job opportunities. It already is. And it will effectively double uh, rail and it will significantly increase uh, bus uh, rider access and opportunity as well. Uh, I'm the author of the fair evasion motion that said that there should be no racial profiling on Metro and I'm pleased that that was unanimously adopted by the board of Metro some three years ago. Uh, I also authored uh, and moved forward an agenda that essentially said that Students, particularly the community college students, ought to have an opportunity to have substantial discounts on a mess Metro, Trade Tech, and a whole range of those community colleges there stood up to support it. And then we lowered the rates for literally 5,000 riders in an attempt to make sure that it was a prudent thing to do. And so I think it's important to recognize that Metro is a fundamental part quality of life issues for people. The Crenshaw line is coming. Glad to be the author of moving that forward. I simply say to you, uh, Channing, been there, done that, committed to do more. Thank you very much. because my buses and trains are full, and they're full of women, women in the morning that are going to work. We have a huge issue of equity on our public transit, because as they're building more trains in, in Wilshire, you see them underground. Yeah. But guess what's happening on in Crenshaw? Yeah. It's not the same. Why? You gotta be wondering. Yeah. You gotta be wondering why are we left with not this so great stuff. It's not fair. And what I want is a public transit that is fast, that takes me places. I wanna take the bus every day. I wanted to take the bus here. And you can. I want it to be free, completely free. We deserve that. Two days ago, Kansas City did it. We can do it too. And guess what? We're not gonna be the ones paying for it. Cap and trade funds can, measure M can, and also we gotta make sure that the bus go faster. So in rush hour, when we have you know different parking zoning in place, we need to make sure that those lanes are dedicated for the buses so that we can go back and forth really fast. That's what we're gonna do together. Martinez gets to be the first to answer the question, and the question is about green space, which 
Study after study shows access to green space incredibly helpful, incredibly vital for both mental and physical health. Uh, right now, this district is very uh, lacking when it comes to parks and green space. We would like to hear from each of the candidates. What steps would you take to create green space in the 10th district? What funds would you use to do so? Chen. Well, the first thing is I'm fighting for no cars in LA. Um, and that's a big factor in it because virtually everything, not just in the 10th district, but in the entire city, are geared to the single passenger automobile, which happens to be the largest polluter in the entire country right now. And so if we start fighting for no cars in the way and you know, what are called, I think I've heard the term, uh, auto diets, which is a new term for me, but basically saying that you cannot drive your car on certain days and you cannot drive your car during down certain streets and really implementing a lot of pedestrian walkways, bus only lanes, and more parks. I think we do have a large parking lot in the 10th district, but right adjacent, the Kenneth Hahn Park. Um, and, you know, I mainly want to fight for expanding the park and closing the Inglewood Oil Park. Well, thanks for the acknowledgement of the great work at the Kenneth Hahn Park. That's a product of the Whitney Thomas administration. Dominated units. Now we're going to have 100 acres of park space. It's going to be tremendous adjacent to uh, the community that we describe as the 10th Council District as Stoneview, a nature center, the first urban nature center in this region. Uh, that's the kind of way that you create a green space, and I'm proud of the work that we've done that. We need to do more for the five parks in the 10th District. Uh, we can work through Proposition A resources, Quimby funds, we have to move all that forward. We need to appeal to private sector participants, philanthropy, to help us get this done. Uh, this is what we're doing uh, at a park called Victoria in the city of Carson, changing that to 178 acres from 178 acres of less than desirable use in the sport of golf to a fabulous recreation center for children, for seniors, for those who want to make something good happen for our communities. I know what to do with green space. You make it green, you make it active, and you elevate the quality of life and the environment for all who can enjoy it. In September of last year, I hosted a town hall meeting with members of our community to talk about parks because this is a map of our district, and here you can see the places where we lack parks. So we have had elected officials that had the opportunity to utilize the Quimby fee, which is generated by developers that build in our district, and we're supposed to reinvest it in our community, and build something, but guess what? We yet to have a park. So with different nonprofit organizations, we did a study, and you see these streets? This is where we can have parks today. And that's what I'm committed to do. We need to take the Queen Beefy, the Measure A for new parks and, and park maintenance, Prop 68 to plant more trees, to make sure that our current parks are upgraded, are beautiful, are clean, that we can utilize them. And also we need new parks as well. We need to rethink the way we think about open space. There's a lot of little nooks and corners that can bring us together as a community if we have greenery and plants, community gardens. That's what I want to do. And let me tell you, we have somebody here sitting with us that has the opportunity to build more parks in this district. That says that is our resident of this district for years and yet want to have a park. So let's get it done for Park. You have the power to give me a park. 
And you have well, that mask up. I'm going to give you a part. Don't worry about that. You're going to give a part. We are yet to see. <laughs> We are rather park poor, and in the Koreatown portion of the district, we are so lacking in green space. The pricing is too much for anyone to purchase this land anymore. But what we can do is use rooftop greenery. It makes a huge difference. When you have green space, when you bring communities together, that's what can happen. The Quimby funds are not being used because the council member didn't use it. I will use those Quimby funds to bring about the green space and the parks. And you know what we can do? We can have more joint use agreements with LAUSDs. The schools are our green space. It's our open space. We can use this. That is how we get more green space for our community members, where kids and adults can have a place to play where we have opportunities to just relax a bit. That's what green space does. And you know what? What if we had a dash that took us to Kenneth Hunt Park? It's more accessible. That would do something for us. All right, our next topic is going to be police accountability. This is my real work, wheelhouse from a scholarship standpoint. I've been writing and active in this area for some time, and I've been able to see, I look out into the attendees here, I see many people from the Black Lives Matter marches that I've been involved in through the last five years, probably the biggest social movement in our generation in the last 10 years, Black Lives Matter. Say his name, say her name, you know the names. Um, and even today here, we've heard one of the candidates say we need to get the police off the buses, safety from the police, right? So we, we have a real police accountability crisis. How do we build trust and confidence in the police and the community? And so my question is this. What would you do to foster greater connection between police officers and the communities they serve? And what resources would you offer to some of our city's most vulnerable, such as runaways and minors, addicts, individuals with serious mental health issues, and victims of domestic violence. And we'll start with, correctly this time, I think, Mark Ridley Thomas. Well, thank you very much. I've spent the last literally 40 years working on the issue of police accountability in the Los Angeles uh, Police Department. Fast forward to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Many of you remember the name of Eula May Love. Uh, that's when we began the, the work on this, calling for police accountability, uh, moving in the direction of inspector generals and police departments, saying that there had to be citizen oversight that would be independent. I made that happen significantly in my work on the city council, and most recently on the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Never did I imagine that we would have a sheriff like we have right now, uh, who is resistant forms than would be appropriate. So you can expect uh, that I would stand up and speak truth to power as I've done over the arc of my career. And I want to make it clear, I'm enjoying the support of the uh, Police Protective Union because they know that I will tell them uh, clearly and straightforward what my intentions are. Yes, we have to have public safety in our communities, but it needs to be 21st century century constitutional uh, public safety with community-based policing and all of the elements that make this police department what it can and should be. I'm not interested in bashing LAPD. I'm interested in holding them accountable for the benefit of the people of the 10th Council District. The reality is that LAPD is getting a lot of our money on their budget, and they're not delivering what we need. Oftentimes, we feel like the police is not protecting us, but it's actually profiling us. Right. And I want to see 
an officer involved shooting data that is actually transparent, that we can see. We deserve to see that. When there is an, a shooting involvement, I want to see that. We also deserve to have an independent body of citizens that can provide oversight to LADW, to, to the LADW. We have something like that currently. But go, go ahead and look what the names are. We have a nearly billionaire empowered leading that group. Who can hold the police accountable if it's not really people from our community? We also need better training for the police. That is that um, explicit bias and cultural competency. Our, our diversity is our greatest strength. We need to make sure that they treat it all, all with dignity. Now, about the people that are being suffered by these treatments, we need more emergency shelters for women that are experiencing domestic violence. It takes eight weeks for a woman to find a bed somewhere when they're, when they're victims of domestic violence. That's wrong. We need more neighborhood watches that is, that is us. And we need to make sure that the police is accountable. Accountability is what we need. I'm going to give you some straightforward, doable things right off the bat. Body camera footage needs to be made available within days right. and not years. We must hold individual officers accountable and prosecute them accordingly when they break the law. Minority representation in law enforcement will reduce the misunderstandings. And you know how we have police with less brutality? We have more women. Let's get a woman in, up at the top, and then she will make sure she brings qualified women officers into the police force, thereby bringing our city into a much safer position. Right. Look, I know it's not every community that has a great relationship with the police, but it gets better if you let them come together in a space. I held barbecues bringing community members and police together. After the first one, one of the community members said, this is the first time I ever sat with a cop and had a meal. I'm sure there, has, there is a change because of that. Look, we've got so many things that we can do to make the police accountable. But first of all, they have to see us as their friends. It's not easy for everybody, but we're going to move towards that. We're going to have community engagement. That's how we break down barriers, by having people talk to one another. respect to all of my candidates, you know, I, black people have been fighting the police since their inception, since we were slaves in this country. Um, and so the only way to make them accountable is to cut the amount of police and for them to leave our community to um, You know, I think some of my opponents are talking about realistic. I think it's very realistic to start cutting the police budget. Everyone knows that you know black people are killed every day, basically. There's a black person killed by police violence. And they have body cameras. We see the footage months later. They have their committees that are watching them. The LAPD actually does have a program that they go through that is cultural content, competency. They go through all this training. We've tried all these things for years. The only way to make them accountable is to literally cut their budget in. The other thing I want to say is that black people are, are the main ones under attack. We're the 55% of tickets on Metro, right? And 60% of the rest on LAPD. We're only 9% of the population. And in yeah. fact, I was talking to an Uber driver who was telling me the updated stats are actually we're only 6% of the population, right? How is it that we're 6% but getting 50% of the actual arrest? There is no way to, you, you yeah. just have to cut the police. That is the only thing. Well, that is a good place to get to our sixth topic. This is the show me the money question. Uh, the increasing costs of running the city of Los Angeles, including budget deficits, uh, which as LA Times has been reporting, triggered by both police and 
uh, firefighter wage increases, a tremendous area of concern for residents gathered here today. We'd like to hear from each of you, starting this time with Aura, your top three priorities for cutting city expenses, as specific as possible, if you will. Thank you. So we just passed the largest budget uh, for Los Angeles from 10.6 billion dollars. And one of the things that you notice in the process of building up our budget is that we have budget advocates that the city doesn't li listen to. And, it's, and budget advocates that are part of our community. So we need to make sure that the city listens to our budget advocates and have our best interests at heart. Now in terms of, uh, in terms of um, spending and, and expenses, so I was a commissioner for the Department of Water and Power for the LNEWP. And, and actually one of the reasons why I decided to run for office is because I saw firsthand the incredible spending in, in, in things that didn't make any sense to me, where we have redundancy. Like in other places, like for example, in the sanitation department, where they have about seven to 10 assistant managers and we can build those together and reduce in cost for budgeting. Now, the reality is that we have places like LAWA and like LADWP that, that they have discretionary fund. That the city is not telling them how to spend their money and guess what? We're the ones that pay for it. We're the ones that pay for the water and the power bill and the sewage. And the city is not telling DWP what to do because they just rubber stamp whatever they want to do. So my proposal is we need to start cutting on the budgets, on the, on the uh, expenses that they have that are necessary, and we need to rethink about more efficiency on those services that we, at the end of the day, are the ones that have to pay for. You know, officers and firefighters doing paper is a waste of our money. We should use less expensive civilians to do the administrative paperwork. And you know, we would save hugely on um, what retirement costs, because we know what that's like, the pensions. Can you imagine if we stopped privatizing city services? Because initially it may seem like the private sector is giving us a better deal or a lower cost, but let's be honest, at the end of the day, a private entity needs to make a profit and the money keeps rising and rising and we've lost our city employees. That's one other way to save money. And you know what? I told you about economies of scale. I believe in this and that means all departments shouldn't be able to go buy one at a time. We should use bulk. It's like going to Costco. We know it's cheaper to go to Costco to buy in bulk than going to your local store and getting, you know, toilet paper. We can save money. We may say it's pennies, but all these pennies add up because there are more than a hundred different departments and commissions that have the power to purchase. And you know, when it comes to saving taxpayers money, she's the DWP commissioner that helped raise the rates. Better informed. <laughs> Clearly, you're misinformed. <laughs> I, I knew I came here for a reason today. <laughs> well, you can all go to the LADWP.com website and see when were your last uh, rates uh, high, and then message Grace on her social media and let her know what your findings were. So when you do go look at the DWP website and look at what our LADWP is being investigated by the FBI, you'll know Costco up. With respect to our other candidates, with Alba and Grace, I'm gonna have to jump in here with respect to our other candidates who want to give them the opportunity to talk. Channing Martinez has the floor. <laughs> Make Channing forget his response. <laughs> uh, oh my God. 
I'm almost afraid to mention the DWP, even though, that, <laughs> even though the FBI wasn't actually in their office this past year investigating them. So that is certainly something that we need to look into in terms of the budget. Um, but again, we need to really take stock of how much it costs to run the current police department. And they take up at least a third of the budget on paper, but that doesn't you know, include their pensions, no. That doesn't include all of the lawsuit settlements that they uh, that they're paying out each year for basically unjustly killing people um, and doing that at the behest of the state, basically, right? Um, and so the best way to actually cut the budget is to cut the police budget. Yeah. I don't support cutting the pensions of other city workers. Everyone knows that most city workers are black. And we're in a very real job needs for black people, and we're not getting as many jobs. And in fact, I want to expand those jobs for black people. Um, so cut the, cut the police, expand jobs for black folks. One of the most interesting things that I've done over the arc of my career is engage constituents in the budget process. So the Empowerment Congress affords constituents an opportunity to look at the budget and to make recommendations as to what they would make priorities. That then gets translated in terms of budget motions at the time of budget deliberations. One specific recollection that I have is um, where there was a need for more building and safety inspectors uh, to move through our respective communities to raise the quality of life with respect to uh, dilapidated buildings that run down neighborhoods and property values, etc. So I was pleased to take that motion forward and to get more building and safety inspectors. I want to say you get what you pay for. Talking about cutting uh, city services and dialing back resources is only going to exacerbate the tensions and the problems that we currently have in getting more city services. More to be said on that score, the proprietary departments, the harbor, uh, the airport, the Department of Water and Powers, they do play a role. They could be a, play a bigger role, but I'm telling you now, you get what you pay for, and we need to figure out ways to get more resources to make sure that constituents get what they need and deserve. At this juncture, we've got a couple items of business. First, um, candidates I know prior to gathering on the stage, there were some questions about one of the topics uh, in the lightning round. You should each have a response on your cellular devices if you need one to get that message that came in was texted and emailed to you. I can supply it and I'll let you take a look while we invite Jessica to our stage to talk about audience questions which are coming down the pipeline. Hi everyone. So we'll begin the audience question and answer period in about 10 minutes. If you have a written question that we've gotten several from you already, but if you still have one, please hand it to the volunteers who will be coming down. They'll either be carrying a mic. Ah, oh, yeah, I see some of them over there. Uh, they'll be carrying a mic, and you can hand them your written questions. Um, and if you'd rather ask your question, if you haven't submitted a written one, you can line up at these three points in the aisles where the volunteers who have mics will be standing. So you can ask your question that way. Please be brief and relevant and respectful when you ask it. We will alternate from reading a written question to asking a question from the mic. So um, for those who are at the mic, if your question's been asked already, um, you can just let the next person ask their question. All right, so we'll cover as many questions as we can until noon. All right, now, we will begin our lightning round. And the lightning round is a set of questions that candidates will be asked to answer as quickly as possible. We're going to try to get to as many as we possibly can in the next 15 minutes. Candidates may choose one of four answers. Support, oppose, I don't know, 
Or finally, it depends on and fill in the blank with just one theme that takes no more than five words. All right? Lightning round. All right, so let's begin with lightning round. And we're going to start with Grace U. Start with um, first question Citizen role in police disciplinary hearings. Support. And Channing, it'll go to you. Support, oppose, I don't know. It depends. Five words. It depends on if citizens actually have the ability to prosecute. Support. Support. All right, next up, beginning with Channing Martinez, inclusionary affordable housing. Support. 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 Absolutely support. Next, repurposing of existing structures, closed schools, hospitals, courthouses, or other public buildings as shelters, rather than selling them. Strongly support already doing it. Support. Support repurposing existing structures. Support. Uh, beginning with Margaret Lee Thomas, rent freeze for all existing, I'm sorry, rather, Ora Vasquez. It's a lot to go through when you go fast. Yeah. Rent freeze for all existing tenants for a period of time. Support. Depends on how long. Oh, support. Uh, support on all affordable housing. Reduce city pension for individuals receiving pension or retirement payments from any other source, especially any other public agency or office, whether city, county, state, or federal. Gracie, Gracie, one more time. The question, reduce city pension for individuals receiving pension or retirement payments from any other source, especially any other public agency or office, whether city, county, state, or federal, basically trying to avoid double dipping in public funds. Support for new hires. Oppose. Yeah, I oppose unless it's something like the drop program, the deferment retirement options plan that we've heard so much about it. Otherwise, it's problematic. Oppose. All right, the next one road diets and dedicated bicycle and bus lanes. Channel. Support. 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 Vacancy tax fee, Mark Early Thomas. Support. 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 Uh, out of Vasquez, installation of prefabricated or tiny houses for shelters and supportive houses. Absolutely support. Absolutely. Support. 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 Great you. Transfer tax on city. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I said support. Just hold it. Support. Already doing it. Thank you. All right. Grace you transfer. Yes, this is the one we're dropping. So we're moving on to the developer incentives, such as TLC density bonuses. Support if it actually increases ridership. Oppose. Support. Oppose. All right. That is the end of our lightning round. Let's everybody just take a deep breath for a moment. And I'd like to say this is a lot. This is like a game of Twister, trying to remember who we're at and what questions we're at. And we did it. So now it's the really great part where we get to turn to you, uh, our audience members, for questions. Uh, and we'll begin with the first written card that we have here. Do you oppose or support SB 50 and why? And I believe we left off on this last lightning round with. I think you, um, um, Grace you. So I think we're starting. Yes. I oppose SB 50 because there is no affordable housing requirements. There is lack of local control, and we need it. And you know what? HPOZs that came about because community members spent years detailing and making sure we got the record straight, they didn't allow for this to stand. So, I oppose 
also SB 50 as well for those same reasons. There's no affordable housing and low-income housing. Um, I have to be honest with you, I have to do a lot more research on the bill. Um, but from what I've read about it, I, I oppose it. It's problematic, um, and it's more of a Northern California solution than it is a Southern California solution. It's not adequately cooked. And to the extent that that's the case, I want to restate that we need redevelopment policies so that communities can thrive. I oppose SB 50, number one. It is, it, it's, a, it's, a it's a state regulation that is designed to take oversight from local communities, to, to really create it to displace people in our communities. It doesn't have any affordable housing at, in, invested in it. And for me, something that is really important is that it doesn't have to follow CEQA, CEQA, which is the environmental regulations that protect us. So as we often see communities of color get the dirty places, the contaminated places, and that's where they send us to leave. And that's why I post SB 50. We cannot allow that one more time in our communities. We deserve better. All right, will you stand up to developers? <laughs> All right, you tear down affordable housing to build giant buildings that gentrify our neighborhood. Will you do, what will you do to ensure these new developments have at least 50% affordable housing and are available to existing residents? Start with Channing. Great, so the first thing I would do is recalculate what affordable means and recalculate what income. Um, and then, you know, the only way to force private developers to comply is to start really putting a lot of regulations on them through the building and safety department and through permitting process, and I would make that happen. Again, the best way to get uh, developers to comply is through uh, redevelopment law and resources. I would say further that <clears throat> it is a way to get nonprofit developers into the mix. All the work that this uh, church did, uh, the Fame Economic Development Corporation, the affordable housing it did along Western Avenue and throughout the community was done with the support of redevelopment. If you get more nonprofit developers in play, kind of community participation and the way in which we wish for the outcome to be will come to fruition. And so there's a lot of ways to get this done. And I'm simply saying the support for affordable housing typically happens with non-profit developers. We don't want to kill all developers. We want to make sure the good developers are on our side making our communities better. And that's what I have supported. That's what I am supporting, and that's what I will support well into the future. Of course I will stand up to developers. Number one, we need to make sure that they stop polluting also our political process by regulating them and not allow them to continue contributing incredible amount of money on our local elections. That's number one. Number two, we need to make them accountable. If, if there's 20% that they need to build affordable and affordable housing, we need to make sure that they actually do it. Enough with all these tax breaks, enough with this like bending over for them. We need housing that is affordable to us. Now, let me tell you how we're gonna do that. We're gonna partner up with nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to build affordable housing in our communities that can employ people from our communities. Number two, we're going to build more land trusts because we deserve to own our own homes and we deserve for those, for those homes to stay in our community. That's what we're going to do and, and, and avoid displacement. And, and lastly, we need to make sure that developers are paying their fair share in taxes and in the revenue that our city needs so that we can function. I've already stood up to developers. Yes. And you, when it came down to someone putting their name on the lawsuit to sue the city, I gotta tell you, most people shied away. But I'm willing to stand and take 
my feet and my actions to court. I've done that numerous times because the city and our residents need help from our own elected officials. When nonprofits try to come in like Mercy Housing, the nonprofit developer is having a really difficult time because the city is not making it possible. They stymie it. I would be a city councilwoman who works with these nonprofit developers to make sure that they can be built and that we can have affordable housing. And in the city, in District 10, where the median income is 44,000, that would mean an $1,100 rent, not the brand new 2,500 for a one bedroom. Look, the lack of enforcement on developer, developers is awful. There's no enforcement on so many of the rules that are here to protect the people. I will be a city councilwoman who enforces the law. Building and safety is supposed to do its job, and you know there's been too much payola going on there too. All right. We've got our first question from the audience, ma'am, in the center. Hi, this is a question for Mark Ridley Thomas. Uh, our district has been used for too long as a stepping stone to greater power and more money for the council person who gets elected. And uh, we, do, we have not had representation of a, with a council person who's gotten into the weeds with our, with our community, i.e. homelessness. We had suites and that was it. We, they had no partnership with local organizations that were, were working with the homeless, none by our council person. So what I'm asking you is, are you going to, can you promise that you will not use this position to try to become mayor? Can you promise that you will focus only on our community for the next four years at least? I think it's a matter of public record that I have rolled up my sleeves and leaned in on the question of homelessness. Just this last evening on the matter of the count, um, it was clear that there was a need to do some work on Venice and right in relation to Kaiser Permanente. Uh, check the record. I was there, I'll be back there, and not only there, but in Lumberg Park, in Mid-City and next to Village Green. So I understand where the homeless crisis is the case. As to the other part of your provocative question, <laughs> I would simply say this. We're governed by ethics ordinances. You can't run for two offices at one time. Is excuse me. Excuse me. You can prepare to run. Yes. You can prepare to run. Well, um, I prepare for range of things in my life and a range of eventualities. I'm focused on the 10th council district over the hour. And, and I think in order and I, and I know there's an attempt to provoke me. Listen, um, I know there's an attempt to provoke me on this question. Man, you need to ease up. And because this is one of our submitted questions and to give all the candidates an opportunity, let's make this an across the board question. Will you commit to serving your full term if elected as opposed to running for a higher office and you can continue with our investments? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't have any limitations saying that I can only run for one term like <laughs> my opponent Marie Thomas. I am committed to stay here and to work hard and to work with all of you and fight for what our community deserves, and stay here the full length. And when, once you elect the first woman and the first Afro-Latina as your councilwoman, we're gonna do magical things for our district. We're gonna make it work for us. We're gonna have a voice at City Hall. And we're finally gonna see the much needed change that our district needs. I am committed to serve 
serving out my four years. I guess the spirits agree. I will serve those four years. I, will, and I know what it takes to run for office. Right now, at, I'm not taking new clients as an attorney. If you want to go win a race, you got to be all in. You cannot be double-minded doing two things. If we've got a job to do. As a councilwoman, my focus will be to fix the problems, right? Starting with the street lamps, the potholes, the pipes that are 100 years old. Infrastructure needs attention. It's not just the sexy things. It's not just the homeless. It's also affordable housing and infrastructure. If we don't have good infrastructure, the city will continue to crumble. Uh, I certainly plan to serve all four years. The other thing I want to say is that I'm the only person on this stage that has not worked for one of the government agencies or companies that have oppressed our communities for the last 50 years. As I started with, I'm running as an organizer. And frankly, the lives of our people and the lives of our community are at stake. And many of us that are running in the elections, not me included, of course, are using this as a stepping stone, as a next step in their career. And I'm running because we've been fighting these, been fighting these in, I'm sorry, uh, companies for the last 50 years. We've been fighting the Metro. We've been fighting the LADWP. We've been fighting the Department of Transportation for the last 50 years. And I don't think that we should be voting for the same exact people that have worked for these agencies for the last 50 years. And now they're prepared after 50 years to do something. I think we need the movement in the city hall and to actually take a lot of power. Woo! All right, we're going to take the next question from Donnie. Supervisor Riley Thomas, you voted to support overturning Martin v. Boise, which further would, fur would have furthered the criminalization of the unhoused. Miss Yu, you led a protest against the opening of an emergency shelter in your neighborhood, citing concerns of criminal activity and service resistance, which contribute to the stigmatization of the unhoused. So my question to all of you is, what are your concrete plans to counter these stigmas, particularly given your histories, that aren't based in statistics, to counter the overcriminalization of unhoused communities that currently exist, and reform LAMC 4118D, 5611, 6344, and 8502, which, which further the cycle of homelessness for uh, members of our community? Um, let's begin with, um, who was the last one? I think it was Ms. Yu, so we'll start with Ms. Martinez. Okay. Um, first off, I would, I, I would get rid of the homeless sweeps. They're not right, they're not humane. And, you know, there was just a few weeks ago a young man that was in front of my campaign office who I've taken a video of, and he was actually at a job interview, and while he was gone, the Department of Sanitation came and they threw all of his stuff out, including his own, his ID and all of his necessary materials. Um, you know, that it's inhumane. And if the city is getting into the details of what you can and cannot have on the streets, instead of actually prioritizing just building the damn affordable housing and building the damn emergency shelters, it makes no sense. There are not, there's not one emergency shelter for just a random right. you know, person in South LA. Yep. Um, and it's been 50 years. And so I don't think that we should continue you know, voting for the same candidates that keep making the same promises. I think we need to build for, uh, emergency shelters right away. That's the first step. Um, and get the police out of the actual world of uh, yes. homelessness, period. I concur that the uh, police department should not be the front line on homelessness, and so do they. Uh, this is the work of those who have a different skill set and totally different training. And that's why um, the record will reflect that I'm the author of the Office of Diversion and Reentry, so that people don't go into uh, the 
criminal justice system, that they are not incarcerated, but they are placed in community-based settings with a range of support. To date, we have um, transitioned some 3,000 plus individuals. The recent RAN report indicates that there are more than 3,000 yet in jail as we speak who are eligible for diversion and reentry, and we're on a mission to accom accommodate that. At the original Martin Luther King Hospital, 500,000 square feet, I want to make it clear that it will be the, the county's first and only behavioral health center, which will focus away from, away from the criminalization scenarios and into helping healing. Everyone who knows anything about those who are mentally ill knows that you can't get well in a cell. And to the extent that that is the case, we are committed to it. And you will be invited to a grand opening in October of this year that addresses a new behavioral health center for those who are eligible and deserve better treatment. our homelessness crisis seriously and that offers bold solutions that are compassionate. The sweeps are not working. Criminalizing the homeless where they're the worst is also not going to work. What they need is for us to say yes in our backyard. Yes to shelters that we need. Yes to places where they can get job training yes to places where they can come and get the mental health that they need. Where, they, if, where if you are on the verge of being homeless, you have a place to go. That if you're sleeping in your car, at least you have a place where you can park and use a restroom at night. That's the bare minimum that we can do, that we must do as a community. And it's gonna take all of us and yes, we're going to stand against developers, and we're going to build more affordable housing, and we're going to raise the minimum wage, and we're going to get buses to be free so that our quality of life can be better, and our cost of living can be lower so we can prosper. Because that's the kind of city that we need, and that's the kind of help that the homeless need. So more than ever, I'm asking you, as a fellow immigrant that could be one of them, to stand together for the homeless, to work together as a community, and to find solutions that affect all of us, that are sound for all of us, and that are going to need all of us. Thank you. The homeless sweeps have not been positive because it has caused deaths in CD10 when people's medication is taken out with the tents. Look, I understand that, but I'm also going to be someone who says we do need health concerns to be met. Okay, so it's a fine balance, but the police should not be involved in these homeless sweeps. It should be those with better skill sets, such as social workers and mental health advocates and psychiatrists. I also believe that my neighbors at the UNNC, United Neighborhoods Neighborhood Council District, we agree to homeless housing for seniors who are formerly homeless or currently homeless because the government, because the city worked together, right? We can say yes when we're engaged and brought in from the get-go, but when you try to come in and say, it's going over there, we're like, wait, 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 what happened? We want to know what's happening. I think that's what we as citizens need to know. We need to be part of the process. That's me, due process, an opportunity for everybody to understand what's going on. Just like you are here to see who we all are, you get to make that selection after listening to us, reading up on our websites, going on Google and searching us. We are going to turn to our next audience card and then we'll be taking our
our next audience question here from the middle. Our next audience submitted questions. What are your plans for ensuring your accessibility to your constituents? Uh, Mark Hurley Thomas, Oh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm intending fully to do more of what I've done for the art of my career. That is to build uh, uh, deeper, broader, more targeted um, uh, neighborhood council profile in the 10th district, uh, the Empowerment Congress, uh, major event this past uh, Saturday at Drew University of Medicine and Science, slated to do it in 2021 focusing on issues that are relevant to the quality of life of our constituents. And we meet monthly various committees on economic development, on uh, public safety, on mental health, on the environment, on a range of issues, arts and culture. And so I develop and structure my office in a way that constituents have access not only to me at a policy level, but to my staff at a constituent services and delivery level. That's the way the office is structured and designed. In addition to that, you'll get the benefit of someone who will engage directly with the neighborhood councils. All of them are in a structured, organized way to enhance the agenda of the neighborhood councils in the 10th district. I don't see running for public office to do anything more than to increase the quality of life and to demystify government so that the people who are to benefit from government can do precisely that. Thank you. So the, uh, the, the idea of accessibility is very important to me. And you can see that already in my, in my campaign as a candidate. I encourage people to get in touch with me via my social media to ask me questions. When we go door knocking and we meet somebody, we leave a note telling them that I have a phone number and they can reach out to me. Because I believe that as a councilwoman, you not only you shouldn't only be accessible to the people that you know, you should be accessible to everyone in this room and every single body in this in this district. Of course, engaging with the neighborhood councils is important. It's a key role. But I also want to see our office, the city council member's office, to be more like community centers, where nonprofit organizations can have meetings, where members of our community can come and, and, and congregate and have new ideas and bring new energy to City Hall. That's what I want to see. And most of all, my campaign's promise is a movement. Last election, Almost over 12,000 people voted. Guys, we're 135,000 people that can vote in this district. We need to wake up, we need to vote, we need to elect new government, and you guys need to come with it because that's what we deserve and that's what we need at City Hall. Thank you. The question was about accessibility. Am I gonna be someone that you see you see me all the time, whether it's in Jefferson Park, or Rainier Village, South Robinson, Lamarck Park, until they ask me to leave because they made up these phony rules about nonprofits not being able to do certain things. I'm an attorney with nonprofit experience. Trust me, I wouldn't want to break the law, especially as I'm running for office. You know what I'm talking about. There's unseen hands pushing things. But I'm fighting that. And I will continue to fight that. Look, accessibility is about being present, seeing me at the Crenshaw Mall, at the local grocery store, at the restaurant, knowing, hey Grace, good to see you again. That's me. And we will have office hours in, in the evening hours so that you can come by. We'll have town hall meetings. I want government to change into this 21st century so that it isn't about a nine to five or a nine to six. We need to make government accessible to the people and I will ensure that. Well, it's funny, 
my office is in the Mer Park, and I can barely make it down the stretch of Degnan without seeing someone that I know who is saying hi to me. Um, and mainly that is to say that the job of the organizer is to have the heartbeat of the people and to be in the streets, and that is exactly what I do. I'm the facility manager of Strategy and Soul on King and Crenshaw. We have a theater, bookstore, organizing office, and we are actually also in three high schools, Augustus Hawkins High School, Roosevelt High School, and Alchi High School. I am constantly in the street uh, working with folks. We also work very closely with Black Lives Matter LA. We work very closely with Los Angeles Community Action Network. Um, and you know, the last thing is that I also run a radio show called Voices from the Front Lines on KPFK. And the main point of the show is to have, what the title says, Voices from the Front Lines. Those who are doing the work and actually in the movement come talk about their work. And so, you know, I believe that government should be more accessible. And if elected, I would plan to spend 90% of my time in the community speaking with everyone and doing and continuing the work that I'm already carrying out now. And maybe that 10%, you know, voting on, you know, things in the city hall. But, you know, I don't want to spend, you know, five, eight, ten hours in city hall going through papers and going through all the bull crap. We need to be out in the communities. <laughs> right. All right. Our next answer will start with Alva Vasquez. The question comes from this side of the room. I will just tell you, if you're not there, somebody else will eat your lunch and drink your milk. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. We don't have a lot of time left. We do have a lot of questions. I'm going to ask candidates to please limit your response to one minute. You'll get a 30 second warning. When you see the stop sign go up, please wrap it up quickly, just to be respectful for the people who came out this morning today. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. My name is Jun Ki Sama, Wilson Center and Korean Town Neighborhood Council member. I hope everyone has a good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I want to ask to all candidates, New York City has 51 council members and 3 million residents of Chicago has 50 council, city council members. Unfortunately, Los Angeles has only 15 council members. The city chart set up the, almost one century ago and the residents of 1 million. Right now, the 4 million people live in Los Angeles. I want to ask, strongly ask the old candidate, would you support the city charter reform to increase the member of a city council member for next generation? as passionate as you as to increase the number of city council members in our city. We serve, we, our city has 4 million members as you, as you stated. We are only 15 city council members. Just in, just in District 10, we have 250,000 people. That's not even a small city, that's a medium or a large sized city. In places like New York and Chicago, they have done that and it works. You need better services. You need a, a city council member that is going to be accountable to you and that can serve you well. And I think having more city council members can help our government and can help us provide better services. Thank you. I certainly support having more accessibility to your elected officials and therefore increasing the number of city council members is perfectly fine, but we also need to make sure that the budget does not grow. So that means staff and uh, salaries of current elected officials must come down because we cannot continue to grow the pension costs. We gotta look at the bottom line. 
We don't want taxpayers to have to pay more for better representation. We can do it with what we have now if we use our money wisely. I totally disagree. Um, and the reason, I mean, just look at the national news. Everyone's trying to get Congress to do something. There's hundreds of them. They can't even get them to do something, right? right. Um, in New York, we know a lot of organizers, and a lot of organizers are talking about the fact that they have to lobby so many people in order to just get basic human and civil rights. I don't support uh, dividing this up. Um, and in fact, if we are going to look at you know who's representing who, I think we need to look at the county. Mark Ridley Thomas is on the county board of supervisors, one of five uh, members of the county. They're representing three million people each. That, to my opinion, is actually a travesty. Hmm. Thought I was going to agree with Channing until he uh, went off the rails. <laughs> Voices, uh, voices from the front line, Channing Martinez on KPFK. I did Move in LA with Avis Ridley Thomas on KPFK from 1986 to 1991, and we rocked the house. So, Channing, I want to say to you that I do not represent three million people. I represent two million people, and uh, there are ten million people in the county of Los Angeles divided by five gives you two million. And so I simply want to say this, the people do not wish to have government expanded. It has been rejected over and over again, attempts to expand city councils, attempts to expand the border support.